I'm Liam Bartlett, filling in for Michael Usher. Welcome to Spotlight. Tonight... Police emergency, this is Simone. Yeah, hi, my son is missing. He's three and a half. What really happened to little William Tyrrell? <laughs> the boy in the Spider-Man costume. From the start, I always had concerns. For the first time, his biological mum reveals her concerns about his foster parents. My son would come with bruises, snotty noses, not dressed, like, appropriately for the weather. Do you think he's out there somewhere? I hope so. Now, leading experts reveal how the investigation was botched from the very beginning. This was a troubled task force now. Gary Jubal and another detective had to be kept apart in the homicide squad, punching each other out. But in a surprise twist, we'll reveal why there's finally hope of finding William Tyrrell. The disappearance of William Tyrrell has captivated and concerned Australians for almost a decade. He was three when he vanished. That image of the little boy in the Spider-Man outfit haunts us to this day. Two weeks ago, on what would have been William's 12th birthday, New South Wales police claimed they'd finally cracked the case and urged the state's prosecutors to charge the missing boy's foster mother over his death. She strenuously denies any wrongdoing. There's no doubt this is a case that divides people, and probably none more so than our panel tonight. Each of our guests have a unique insight into this investigation that will help us understand why it has played out the way it has. Caroline Overington is a Walkley Award-winning journalist who has covered this case in detail in her book, Missing William Tyrrell, and the acclaimed podcast series, Nowhere Child. Former homicide detective Charlie Pazina worked with the Victorian police force on some of that state's highest profile criminal cases. And Mark Morrie has been on the crime beat since the 1980s and knows this case inside out, having broken the story in 2021 that William's foster mother was in the frame. But William's biological mother says she's had concerns about her son's foster parents from the very start. And I wrote letters back and forth to one of the carers. Yeah, because I didn't really like the care that I thought was being given. Like, my son would come with bruises, um, snotty noses, not dressed appropriately for the weather. Yeah. And you'll hear more from that explosive interview shortly. So how did we get to this point? Let's go back to the very beginning of this case and explain the key moments that have led to these new developments. I think back to that, that moment where I just went, I can't hear him. Why, why, why can't I hear him? And I've just walked out and I just see nothing. And I'm yelling out, William, where are you? You need to talk to mummy, tell me where you are. I can't see you, I can't hear you. Where, where are you? Emergency, this is Simone. Yeah, hi, my son is missing. He's three and a half. How long has he been missing? I th well, I think, well, we've been looking for him now for about 15 or 20 minutes, but okay. I thought it could be five, it could be longer, because he was just playing around here. We heard him and then we heard nothing. I went right through the garage, I went right through the other carport, I went right through everything. I think I came across that person there at some stage, and I said, um, have you seen a little boy, William? This is one of many line searches underway. I've got two kids myself. I'd want as many people out there as possible looking. So we're going to go this way. There's no way in the world William would have gone into that bush. It's too thick. There's Lantana all through it. There is no way in the world he would have gone into that bush. William. Police have it ruled out the little boy may have been kidnapped. Bill Spedding taken away by police. We'll treat this investigation as if William could still be alive. We need to know where he is. I'm very relieved to have told the police everything I can, finding out what happened to young William Tyrrell. Go, William. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Caroline, to you firstly, 
Do you believe this investigation was botched from the get-go? Well, I'm a bit of a softy, Liam, so I probably wouldn't say botched. I think it's important to remember what happened in the very beginning. A little boy was missing and the police had received a call to say that he was playing in the garden and then presumably lost in the bush. So what happened was hundreds of Australians, good-hearted, ordinary Australians, came onto the scene and they came, you know, pony clubs and the SES and surf lifesavers and mums with prams, everybody calling out his name well into the night. They were trying to find him. They thought he's wearing this skimpy little suit and he's going to maybe be out there all night and die of exposure. We really have to find him. In the process, the crime scene was trashed because police didn't put up the police tape that you might expect and they didn't seal the area the way you might expect. They didn't collect all the little bits of rubbish and cigarette butts and look in the wheelie bins, things that you would do now. And as a result, a lot of forensics were lost. But was the intention of those people who were first on the scene a good intention? Of course it was. Mm. Charlie, as Caroline says, hundreds of people searching, mm -hmm. not just police or SES. So in that process, entirely possible that a lot of potential evidence was not only overlooked but also destroyed, yes? Yeah, I don't accept that. But uh, the issue is, and I uh, agree with what Caroline has said, is basically trying to find him. Often, you see, you find a child has been hiding under the bed and that type of thing. So I think the mistake a lot of um, uh, police do in relation to missing persons, they don't start at the highest level of saying, OK, let's, act, let's take this as a crime and work our way down. And that's, that's a big falling on, on behalf of the police. They don't turn their mind to a criminal act. When you say the highest level, so you're saying you should start from the get-go, worst case scenario. It's always been my experience and the ones that I've been exposed to. You start at that highest level, you say, okay, let's work worst case scenario and work our way back. So you've got the search going on and then you've got trained investigators at a specialist level dealing with the family and moving on that way. It's a, it's a, it's a double-edged uh, sword in relation to it. This wasn't done and often it doesn't happen and that's a, bit of a big falling on behalf of the police. Mark, despite the best intentions then, we're now nine and a bit years on from this and still looking, still no William. Well, why do you think this investigation has attracted so much criticism in that time? I think it's because it, people just got fascinated. So people have um, investigated everything. They've become armchair detectives right throughout. Everybody gets fascinated and everybody has a theory. And that's why I think uh, it's become such a high profile. We've seen it over the years from the Beaumont children to Samantha Knight, you know, quite a few cases of over, the, you know, over history. Caroline, despite the fact we still don't know where William is and there's no result per se, is there any positive in the way any of this investigation has been run? One of William's most important legacies is the way police now approach a missing persons case, particularly involving a child. For example, when the little girl Cleo went missing in WA, one of the first things that police did was seal the crime scene. And they checked every uh, piece of rubbish they could find and they got all available CCTV. They wanted to know who was in that campsite, why they were there, did they have a good reason for being there? What time did they leave? In what car were they travelling? Can we see your car? They tested every single footprint they could find in the sand. That is the legacy of William Tyrrell, that when a small child goes missing, we now do assume that it could be something worse than they've gone missing in the bush. It could be an abduction. So those learnings have come from this case? They really have. And that is something that I think we as a community can take comfort from. Because William was a special boy in a way, because he isn't just a child, he's a foster child, which means he's a child of the state. We have all promised to take care of him. And the assumption was that he would be safer with us than with his own parents, and yet he is missing. Now, after two years of searching, police offered a reward for any information. As of today, there will be a $1 million reward for the, uh, the uh, safe return, in fact, the return of this little boy. Um, it is a unique an announcement here in New South Wales. We've never had a $1 million reward ever before. Mark, a $1 million reward uh, gets a lot of headlines. 
But does it do what it sets out to achieve? Does it loosen lips in the right way? In a case like this, I doubt it. Um, unless it was a pedophile ring, perhaps. That, you know, a million dollar reward is there to get headlines, to jog memories, or maybe if there's somebody, to give somebody up. But I, I think in this case, it was purely to keep the story going. Did it also indicate the sort of people that police perhaps thought was involved in the disappearance? Because I know the public, would you agree, Caroline, were pretty shocked when those numbers came out about the number of people around Kendall that were on the sex offenders register list. Oh, I think people would be absolutely horrified to know how many people are on the sex offenders list in New South Wales and around Australia. I'm not sure that I agree with your thinking about the reward. I think old-style police used to say, you can't live with a bad secret on your conscience. Your conscience rattles around and eventually it gets the better of you and you, you have to tell somebody. And so they would wait for people to come forward and, and try to unburden themselves. I just can't keep this secret anymore. Because most people are pretty good. Whereas in this case, they had in mind the idea that they knew who the culprit was and that perhaps this person was married to someone who was scared of him. That was, that was what the thinking was. And if she's scared of him, maybe we can say to her with this million dollar reward, look, you'll get it off your conscience, we'll find William, you can start a whole new life. A million dollars is still a lot of money. You can buy yourself a house, go do yourself, go and set up yourself again, and then we'll be able to find William. That was what they were thinking, and it's not a bad strategy, because if she is frightened of him, and she's thinking, well, I can't dob him in, because then what happens to me? And also, am I gonna get charged? They have to also give us some reassurance about that. As it turned out, their culprit, or their suspected culprit at the time, was the wrong person, so it didn't work. But I think that was their strategy. Yeah, it normally is to try. They normally have a, somebody in mind that they're trying to get someone to give up or give some information to. Let's talk about the suspects, because there's been plenty of them named in the public arena. You said you had absolutely no involvement in William's disappearance. Do you maintain that? Caroline, what do you make of names being released by police to the public? It's a very common tactic that police will use, and it's often because the police would like to put pressure on certain people. Turning over every stone, which is what Caroline's talking about, that's one thing. But to leak intentionally mm. and put people in the frame publicly before any charges have been laid, is that fair? Well, there's different strategies investigators undertake. Uh, and as you say, it's a matter of shaking that tree and putting electronic surveillance systems out there. And the police, in fact, did use significant electronic surveillance on the foster parents, as did the strike force. So hang on, what are, you, what are you saying? You're saying they put the names out publicly and then they plant the listening devices and then listen to what the people are saying in reaction to the public pressure? Well, I can only comment not knowing the, the intricacies of the investigation, but. They are different strategies. As an investigator, you look at, say, OK, how can we start gleaning information? What you allege you've got to prove? And you can do that by what information comes to you, either through witnesses, through forensic evidence, or through electronic devices, as we, as we all know. Listening devices, telephone intercepts. That, what you've said there is exactly right. That is exactly what they do. They might call... A police might call a suspect in, and while he's being interviewed in the police station, they'll pop a bug on the car. And then when he gets back in the car with his wife or his partner or whoever, people are not as clever as you think they might be. And so they'll talk to each other. And one of them might say to the other, so do you think they know? Do they, do they think you did it? All of those um, answers are, are useful to police. But I think you're going, and it, particularly in this case, the way it was done with Spenny. I'm standing in the uh, school hall with uh, Mr uh, William Spenny. My name is uh, Detective Inspector Gary Jubwin. That's not done very often, at all. I know everyone's saying, oh, they put out there to put pressure. They use the reward um, quite often. But I can't remember a lot of cases where they have, like, almost perp-walked <laughs> a suspect. I don't think it's anywhere near as common as what we, we, people are thinking now. Well, everyone wants a solution, and that's a great example, oh, yeah. isn't it? But, but is that the way to shake the tree? Because in Mr Spedding's case, obviously, he's one and a half million dollars richer because he was defamed as a result, and we're still no closer to finding William. Obviously, the investigators at the time and superiors believed 
that was the t a tactic that they were willing to use. Um, how far up the chain it went, I'd like to know, mm. or, or whether it was done at, a, at, at just a task force level. Again, it's all about strategies and how you go yeah, about true. your investigation. We sit here uh, as, a, as a group of people that don't know the inner workings of the investigation. We're surmising you've gone into a depth with uh, your uh, I think research. in this case they were very, very... They believed that they had the right person and that's... They weren't doing that as a diversionary tactic in this case. They well, believed they had the right person yes. and they believed that William might still be alive. And, that and they, so their yeah. feeling was, we need to get this solved as quickly yeah. as we can and the best way to do that is to try to startle or shake any of Mr Spedding's accomplices in this crime into giving up the boy when he's still alive. Uh, now, as it turned out, they were wrong. Has politics played a part in marring the police investigation at all because here's the exquisite irony of this the only person after nine and a bit years the only person to be charged in relation to this and convicted is gary jubilant who 100. was the detective in charge of the whole case well that concerns me the fact is that um you know, here we have the investigator who led the investigation for four years so you're telling me that the hierarchy within the police police service have got no issues with Gary for the four year period and all of a sudden he openly and overtly says to his people I'm going to put a I'm going to record this telephone conversation with this particular person for this reason and he's given the blessings and all of a sudden um, he's charged with that he offense. wasn't given the blessings <laughs> this was a troubled task force now uh, in the middle of this task force Gary Jubal and another detective had to be kept apart in the homicide squad from punching correct. each other out because of the way one detective believed that the investigation was going. That was common knowledge. Correct. So it was a troubled investigation from the beginning. And <laughs> well, you say it was, trouble, but... I mean, it, but it's passionate, it, it, understandably. What it shows... I mean, uh, police come I in know. for so much criticism. The idea that they didn't want to solve... Of course, oh, they, they are so no. passionate about wanting to solve this case. They desperately well, want it solved. And that's why they almost came to blows over the different theories as to who it might be. But you'll always get those different theories in an investigation, team investigation. But at the end of the day, Gary's leading it, and, and that's where the buck stops. He's got to make a decision. And, and when you say the political, if there's something more, more involved, we're political within cr uh, Crime Command or Police Command at the time, this is viewed basically as a minor offence. But to have a man of this guy's standing, Gary Jubilin, with what he's done to this state in relation to the service he's given, to have a conviction, and that doesn't sit right with me. Why convict? The fact is he did it overtly um, and... And, the, and these people knew about it. It's not as if he did it in a clandestine way, and, and that doesn't sit right with me at all. And we'll continue with our panel in just a moment, but next... Why police now believe William Tyrrell's foster mother was involved in the disappearance. We'll also hear from his biological mother, who reveals why she had concerns for his safety in his foster home. From the start, I always had concerns. Like, my son would come with bruises, um, snotty noses, not dressed, like, appropriately for the weather. Welcome back to 7 News Spotlight. As we look into the disappearance of William Tyrrell, we now know that New South Wales Police have handed a brief of evidence to the Director of Public Prosecution. They've recommended William's foster mother be charged with interfering with a corpse and perverting the course of justice. Mark, crime statistics tell us this, that often people closest to the potential victim are the ones responsible. Why has it taken over nine years to come back to almost the source where we find the foster mother is in focus? A new investigation come up, said that we believe there are a lot of inconsistencies. They talk about the fact that she said, I put shoes on him because I didn't want him to step in dog poo and bindies. 
the dog had been dead. So that raised an alarm. Uh, the fact that she then turned around and said, oh, now I remember there were some cars. I saw a car, right, um, a couple of days later. Now, police can't find anybody else who's found that car. And Kendall's not a big place, but they've spoken to everyone. So all that stuff started to mount up. Why it wasn't done originally, maybe they were convinced. You know, I think they had targets. They had a, they had a big pedophile ring. But those points you make were facts, weren't they? As well as, I come back again, the glaring gaps in the timeline as provided by the foster mother have always been there, Caroline. Look, I think this is a difficult question for Australians, but I'm interested to know what you think too. Do you think it's possibly a question of class? Were the police thinking to themselves, it can't be yeah. this really well-to-do, financially secure well, yeah. family from a nice part of Sydney. Maybe it could be the biological parents who are working class and have some issues with drugs and other things. I it could be them, but it's not going yeah. to be this nice I don't family. Think, I, I don't think that would have had any sway with the investigators, because I think these guys have yep. been around to know that, uh, you know, killers come from all sizes. You know? they, do. they do. Now. It may be a, a very smart prosecutor or, or a good prosecutor, like perhaps it happened in Christopher Dawson, could weave the tail and say, look at all these lies, look at all these circumstances, look, we've eliminated all these people, why not put it to well, a jury or a judge? Well, let, I'm just saying, I mean... If, they were, if the police were saying, we think the foster mother killed William, strangled William or beat William, and then covered up the act, by burying his body, that would be one thing. But Without a body, they, they can't prove any sort of physical help. Uh, of but course, now, but if yeah. that's what they were saying, then I could understand why you might hide William's body, because you've, you've strangled him or you've killed him and there's going to be evidence of homicide. What they are, seem to be saying, what they seem to be suggesting is that it was an accident. So I guess the bit that... that but I think you even pointed out that potentially the, the, the problems that, like, if there was an accident, was there abuse beforehand and there's going to be signs of that? No, right. No, um, no, what I'm they're going to lose their, they're going to lose their other foster child. If trial. it was an accident and William has fallen off the balcony and into the bushes below and William has a broken neck and he's died, is your immediate reaction to say, I'm going to take this small boy and bury him, dump him like an old car part in the bush? Wouldn't you call out, oh my goodness, William's fallen, call the ambulance, let's get the ambulance here. Is he alive? Is he breathing? Why, why would your immediate response be, oh, uh, it William might is... might be your immediate response. It might be, <laughs> you don't God, have a look lot what... Of time. You don't know. You I don't have, have no... a lot of time. Look what's happened here. I know he's got these marks or there's going to be evidence of some previous sort of abuse, potentially. And, God, I know they're going to find that, you know. I'm going to have to... I'm going to get rid of... I'm going to have to get rid of, of William. But that's a very dark reaction. Well, I mean, it, it, these things can happen. And murder investigations have no secrets, one cop had once told me. Once, you know, that will start looking into, and they might find evidence on William that could lead them to think that perhaps that was murder, even if it was an accident. Let's talk about the relationship between the two mothers. Because back in 2015, Melissa Doyle spoke to William's biological mum about the case. And in this previously unseen footage, you'll hear for the first time why she was concerned about her little boy's well-being under the care of his foster family. <laughs> he was just like a boy, yeah, really boyish. Day. Okay, so anyone that's watching this, anyone that's going to see you, what do you say to them? What can we do? Um, just... Don't hurt him. <laughs> just let him come home.
What sort of mum did you think you would be? Um, like a nurturing mum, a caring, loving, yeah, a good mum. You weren't comfortable with the family that he was placed no. with? Did you meet them? Did you have much to do with no, them? No, not until William went missing did they want to make, have contact with me. Do you think the foster family that was taking care of William feel guilt? They should. They lost him. From the start, I always had concerns, and I wrote letters to one of the carers. Yeah, because I didn't really like the care that I thought was being given. Like, my son would come with bruises, um, snotty noses, not dressed, like, appropriately for the weather. Yeah. I don't want to blame the carers, but, yeah, they were responsible for looking after him, and they failed. No-one knows their baby better than the mom. And, yeah, his motor skills and everything just deteriorate, right? Like, went downhill once he went into care, like, honestly. So, as we say, that interview conducted by Mel in 2015, the bruises especially, I know little kids, they play and they fall out of trees. And, but it, it, given what we know now, it takes on a different significance, doesn't it? Yes, it does, and it's very difficult to watch that interview, isn't it? Because she, it, it's clear to everyone that William's biological parents really loved him and a decision was made that they were not able to care for him, but they were always hoping to get him back. And I know that what she's saying in that interview is true, that she did write several letters saying that he would be just as happy and healthy at home with her. About a month before William went missing, he was taken to the hospital because he had a black eye. His foster mum said that he'd fallen against a table. There are also some notes from the Department of Welfare or the Welfare Department in which she expresses some concern about his challenging behaviour. I mean, foster children often have challenging behaviour, not always, but they're traumatised, you know, they've, they've moved from their home into another home and they're not quite sure where they belong. The welfare officers had taken a note where they had said that the foster mum was really frustrated by his poor behaviour and she was close to giving up or giving in. You know, that, that's in the documents and that that were produced at the inquest. So I can see why the biological family are saying, well, how bad were we, given that they have other children, how, how bad were we that we couldn't look after him and yet almost as soon as he went into care, he went missing and we don't know what happened to him. Well, until we hear from the DPP's office, we should point out tonight that William's foster mother has put out a statement through her lawyers saying, and I quote, the foster mother has always and maintains she has nothing to do with William's disappearance. They also point out that she had previously been ruled out of any wrongdoing in relation to the disappearance. If she does get charged, that's going to be one of the prime uh, defences that they will be putting up in her defence, her lawyer, saying, well, I was um, uh, cleared by or I was uh, satisfied by the lead investigator that I wasn't involved creates a reasonable doubt Hence, we might lead to an acquittal. And if she had nothing to do with this, then this must be absolutely agonising to not only absolutely. lose your child, your foster child, in such circumstances, and then to be accused, accused as publicly as this by, we assume, the New South Wales Police of having had something to do and with it. Saying that, I don't think the New South Wales Police would take lightly put in a brief to have her charged or to consider having her charged. They wouldn't be doing this, I don't think, for political reasons. Saying that, I mean, they must really believe that she is involved. It's not a small thing to do, is it? It's not, you know. It, it must be torture. It would be torture for her if she's not involved. Mm. But it's not just victims, um, Mark. It's also looking at an accused person. You balance That's it. That's what I mean. We, we've yeah. got to look at it and saying, well, we support both parties. All we can do as investigators is present the facts to a court of law of saying that's what we've found out and it's up to them to either prove innocence or guilt. And that's where we are from a police investigation point of view. Which all brings us to the final question, starting with you, Caroline. Do you think this case, the disappearance of William Tyrrell, will ever be solved? Sometimes I think back to the very first day that he went missing and I remember all those Australians who got out there and were calling out his name and every single one of them wanted to be the one to find him and 
put him on their hip and rush back. I found him. I found him. And for those great scenes of jubilation. And we didn't get that. But we really need that. This case has to be solved. What do you think, Charlie? Will they solve it? Um, as an investigator, I say, on one hand, you never let, give up hope in relation to getting that one phone call. But my experience also tells me, with other cases that have occurred that I'm aware of, that no, I don't believe it will be solved. And the longer it goes, um, the, the less it will be. What, what's going to change over this period of time that we've gone through? So I don't believe it's going to be solved, even though we always hold out hope. Mark, what do you think? Is this the final act in the play? No, I think we will find out what happened to William. I believe something will break with William Tyrrell that will give an answer. I just hope I'm alive. I think it could take a long time, but I do think someone will crack somewhere. Let's keep our collective fingers crossed. Thanks very much for joining us tonight to discuss the case in detail. Really appreciate your time. Mark Morrie, Charlie Bazina, Caroline Overington, thank you. Thanks, Liam. And we'll keep you posted and across any new developments in this case right here on 7 News Spotlight.